Good morning, everyone. We're going to continue along in the chapter or the uh, midterm four review packet up on Carmen. Um, this was the question that I think we had left off with on Friday. And so, just like counting domains, getting a geometry for something like SO3 2 minus, some problems like this, we just have to make sure we get the proper Lewis structure. So, you know, make sure to count the electrons properly. So, six for sulfur, we're just looking position on the periodic table. Three times six for oxygen, have to remember the two for the two minus charge. And so that gives us a total of 26 electrons to distribute. So when we're thinking of our Lewis structure, we'd have three, or at least we'd start with three single bonded oxygens to sulfur, because that's our basic rule, single bond, the non-central atoms to the central atom. Give the non-central atoms an octet with electron pairs, then count electrons, that's 24 electrons used, um, because we have eight around each oxygen. And so that leaves two electrons left over. We place those on to the central atom when we have electrons left over. And so we end up with two electrons, uh, so one pair of electrons on sulfur, and then we have the three bonding domains. Now in terms of formal charges, the formal charge on the O's, each oxygen has a total of seven electrons surrounding it if you cut the bonding pair electron in half. And so that gives each oxygen a formal charge of which should be six for a neutral charge. We actually have seven on the structure, so that's a minus one formal charge for all the oxygens. And then the overall two minus charge for SO3 two minus is obtained by sulfur having a positive formal charge. So sulfur only has one, two, three, four, five electrons surrounding it. it should have six for a neutral charge. So that gives it a plus one formal charge. And so I have a positive formal charge on sulfur. Now we could make a double bond, but that's kind of irrelevant for this question. So we could imagine trying to make a double bond to reduce the magnitudes of formal charge. I think that's probably not the best Lewis structure, um, but in terms of the question, we're just really trying to count domains. So we'd still be counting three bonding domains and one non-bonding domain. So whether it's a double bond or a single bond, or whether you picture this as resonating electron pairs where really resonance would kick in, so we'd have three equivalent SO bonds we really wouldn't have one shorter SO bond, two longer bonds. Even if you thought that was the best Lewis structure, there'd still be some resonant effect. And so we'd have three equivalent bonds for sulfite. Um, but uh, the answer to the question would be, we have four total domains and then three of them are bonding. And so we have the one non-bonding domain. So probably a pretty easy question, but what would the geometry be? So the electron domain geometry would take the domain of tetrahedral because we have four domains. Let's put an electron pair on one of those domains. And let's put oxygens on the other. And so then let's think of the shape that we'd create by this structure here. So we get a pyramidal structure um, on top of the triangular structure. So we call this trigonal pyramidal. So the electron domain geometry is tetrahedral. And then the molecular geometry for the geometry name, we're just naming the shape of the atoms. The electron pair is still there. Um, we just leave it off of the name of the shape of, like think of the uh, molecular geometry being where the atoms. So name the atoms geometry. That would be a trigonal pyramidal. And so think pyramidal is kind of to separate it from planar. So if you're kind of questioning, well, what does pyramidal mean? It means the structure is not planar. Sulfur sticking in a different plane than the oxygen atoms in the molecule. What about PO3 3 minus? What's the electron domain and geometry name for this uh, structure here? So we have 5 plus 3 times 6, now plus 3 because of the 3 minus charge. That gives us also 26 electrons. And so this is going to take that exact same geometry that we just saw. So we're going to have an electron pair on phosphorus for the same reason we had an electron pair on the previous structure. The only difference is that this structure here might be perfectly happy. We wouldn't have to worry about any other alternating Lewis structures because we have a zero formal charge on phosphorus, minus formal charges all the way around on the O's, minus three overall. And so this structure here would take that same tetrahedral domain, trigonal pyramidal molecular geometry. Um, so just remember the electron domain geometry, it's the domain of all the electron uh, uh, pairs around the central atom. So it's the bonding and the non-bondings geometry. And then the molecular geometry still depends on all the other domains. We just name the shape that you get for just the atoms. So very maybe peculiar that we have two geometries that are connected together, but the molecular geometry is just the sort of atoms geometries. This sort of shape that you get for just the atoms.
which molecule below has a T-shaped molecular geometry. So a T-shape would look just like a T. And so you get that structure of having, if you imagine um, um, a central atom connected to non-central atoms that we call B, we get this geometry whenever we have a central atom that has five total domains, but two of them are non-bonding. And then we have the three bonding domains. So we get this geometry whenever we have a trigonal bipyramidal structure. And so trigonal bipyramidal is the name for when you're picturing the bipyramid structure. So the difference between planar and pyramidal is planar is all in one plane, pyramidal is one pyramid, and a bipyramid is two pyramids. So we get the top pyramid and we get the bottom pyramid. And so for the trigonal uh, bipyramidal electron domain, whenever we have two non-bonding domains, we're going to fit this geometry of being T-shaped. That's the only time we could have this possible molecular geometry. And so we're looking for the central atom here that has three atoms connected and then uh, two lone pairs on the central atom. So now we can sort of roll out SO2. Anytime we have three atoms, remember the question would be for three atoms in the, the bond would be, is it linear or is it bent? And so this one here, the only shape possible would be linear or bent. And to figure out which one that would be for SO2, if we just wanted to double check what its geometry would be, we'd have 18 total electrons, three times six. And so we'd have sulfur with the oxygens, lone pairs on the O's. That's 16 of the electrons. The two extra electrons go on sulfur as a lone pair. And so this is going to be trigonal planar domain and then bent molecular geometry. And so that's going to be a bent structure. We're going to have a double bond that resonates as well to sort of give sulfur its octet. So we're going to have a resonating electron pair. All those, both those bonds would be equal in length as a result, um, but certainly not a T-shaped geometry. Same thing with SF2 in terms of it's going to be linear or bent. So we can kind of rule that out right off the bat. Um, we can double check its structure if you guys want to see how we can come up with this geometry in a minute. Um, CF4 has to be, you know, only one of a couple possibilities. For CF4, it's like if it has zero electron pairs on carbon, then it's tetrahedral. If we had one electron pair on carbon in addition to the four chlorines, it could be possibly seesaw. It's probably not going to be seesaw. You probably know it's tetrahedral. Um, or it could be square planar with an octahedral. So if we had two electron pairs on carbon, then you might think that this would be square planar. Now we can rule these two out just by checking the Lewis structure and seeing that there's um, four fluorine single bonded with lone pairs on the Fs. And that's all the available electrons. So when we count four plus 28 for 32 electrons, we have no leftover electrons after we do the four bonding domains with carbon to fluorine. We have no leftover electrons for carbon. So we need one electron pair or two electron pairs um, for seesaw or square planar. So it has to be tetrahedral. For SF2, SF2 would be six for sulfur, two times seven for the fluorine. That's uh, 20 electrons overall. And so we'd have sulfur, fluorine, fluorine either side, lone pairs around the F. That's eight per fluorine. That's only 16 electrons used. The four electrons left over, where do they go? On to sulfur. And so sulfur, um, satisfies its octet now. It has eight electrons surrounding it, and it also has a zero formal charge. Carbon CF4 is formal charge, all zero all the way around. Um, and so we'd have zero formal charges, and this would clearly be a bent bond because it's in tetrahedral domain, be just like water. So even though I've sketched, a lot of times I sketch a Lewis structure, I may not be thinking of what's the actual geometry. It's not 180. So just be careful sometimes if you sketch a Lewis structure to then think, well, what's the actual geometry? The electron domain, tetrahedral. This would then be bent molecular geometry. And so the only option left would be BRF3 to answer the question. And we can double check that that's the right answer by 7 times 4. 7, because both those are halogens, 4 total. That's 28 electrons. And so we can distribute those with three fluorines around bromine. We can give fluorines their octet. And of course, that's 8 each. So that's 24 electrons used, the four leftover electrons onto bromine to give it that T-shaped geometry. And so those electron pairs are now in the trigonal plane. So if you imagine bromine to fluorine this direction, you'd have an electron pair coming straight out, going straight back, and then you'd have the other fluorine straight down.
if you flip your screen, I think you can agree that that looks like a T. So just remember, molecular geometries, you should be able to look at the, the structure if you sketch it correctly and then verify that it really looks the way you think. Like if we really wanted to sketch, you know, SF2, we'd sketch something like electron pairs here and here and then have the fluorines in that tetrahedral spot. So we could always sketch the molecular geometry and verify that this certainly looks like a bent bond. So if you're not sure of a name of a geometry, just try to uh, sketch it the way you think it should look and try to think of what name would go according to that structure. So what about PF3? So for PF3, uh, 5 plus 3 times 7, that's 26. I think we have too many 26 electron structures here because those are pretty easy. Now, like, if you get into the, the habit of kind of seeing multiples of 8 are going to fit into... You know, if we have 16 or 24 or 32 or 40 or 48 total electrons, we're going to fit into the molecular geometry looking just like linear, trigonal, pyramidal, uh, excuse me, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal. But whenever you have this like extra electron, you know that phosphorus has to have that extra electron pair. If we sketch these fluorines here, that's 24 of those electrons. And so the leftover electron goes on to phosphorus. So this is another uh, tetrahedral trigonal pyramidal. So we've had three structures so far that fit the same geometry. Um, let's think about seesaw. That's maybe the one that sometimes, you know, like if you have something like SF4, where we have 6 plus 4 times 7, that's uh, 34 total electrons. This is where you get the geometry that looks like this. We have 32 electrons around the four fluorines. The two leftover electrons onto sulfur. And so then the geometry name, you're just trying to name the shape here. If you notice, if you try to flip this on its side, it kind of looks like a teeter-totter, or we call this the seesaw molecular geometry. So if you can't see that as a seesaw, maybe it doesn't make any sense to you. Or if you're just trying to memorize, if you're just trying to memorize the total number of bonding versus non-bonding domains with the structure, it might be a little bit trickier than just trying to picture what those structures look like and then what the name would be accordingly. So T-shape, you can see a T, seesaw, hopefully you can see a seesaw, tetrahedral, looks like a tetrahedron, etc. In terms of polarities, so we can have molecules like BF3. Uh, where we have all these dipoles, the fluorine's more electronegative, the charges here around the F would all be neutral in terms of the formal charge, but fluorine's more electronegative, wants to pull the bonding pair electrons closer towards itself. We have all these dipole arrows pointing towards the fluorine atom, allowing it to pick up a negative charge, but the key is that the partial negative here is the same as the negative here, is the same as the negative there. I don't get a difference in charge on this molecule on one side compared to the other. If I imagine putting a positive charge, all these negative charges are going to fight over it. The molecule is going to spin, and it's not going to necessarily flow towards the charge. And so um, this molecule here ends up being perfectly nonpolar. Its dipole moment, if you think of that as a measure of polarity, is exactly zero. Um, if we think of CO2, the same thing. Dipole's perfectly canceling. The dipole moment here is equal to zero. If you have a diatomic molecule, as long as we have two atoms in the bond, as long as the atoms differ in polarity and the bond's polar, then the molecule is going to be polar. We're going to pick up these partial negative and partial positive charges. So for a diatomic molecule, all it takes is a difference in electronegativity in the atoms for the bond to be polar and hence the molecule to be polar. But for a bigger molecule that has three or more atoms, like BF3 with four atoms, what we need is not just polar bonds, but we need an arrangement of the bonds that allows the molecule to pick up a different charge on one side compared to the other of the molecule. It's so like CCL4, these dipoles all oppose each other and cancel each other out mathematically. The dipole moment works out to be perfectly zero. We have the same negative charge the whole way around the molecule. But if you replace even just one, if you replace or just add a chlorine to one of the spots of like methane, and we have this one dipole pointing in towards the more electronegative chlorine, we get this big negative charge here that's not balanced and equally so on the spots of the hydrogen on the other sides of the molecule. So this molecule is one that we would say is polar and has polarity. Now the difference here is that nonpolar molecules of comparable size will not have the same attractive forces with each other as uh, polar molecules will. So polar molecules have these built-in charges. Um, their structures will have a stronger attractive force for each other. 
And we're going to see that that attractive force is what allows things to exist at room temperature or at reasonable temperatures and pressures as liquids and solids. And so those are the forces that hold liquids and solids together. So ammonia is able to do this because we have an electron pair here. And so then we have a positive charge developing on the nitrogen, partial negatives. Uh, excuse me. Um, nitrogen is more or less negative. It's the other way around. So we have the dipoles pointing in towards nitrogen. Nitrogen's electronegativity is greater than hydrogen, so it picks up the negative charge. The hydrogens pick up this partial positive that's not balanced on the top side of this tetrahedron structure. So we have a positive side of our molecule, the bottom side. We have a negative side, the nitrogen side. So this molecule here is polar. So what we need for a molecule to be nonpolar is we need it to be a geometry like linear. We need it to be a geometry like trigonal planar, a geometry like tetrahedral with the exact same atom at all spots in the structure. So we need the exact same atom opposing itself here. If we were to change even to this here where we have a sulfur instead of an oxygen, this molecule here would be polar. So we have a difference of polarity now because we don't have the exact same charge on O balancing itself on the other side of the molecule. So sulfur is not as electronegative, oxygen is more electronegative, so we get a bigger negative charge here, smaller negative charge here. So we just need a difference of charge. It doesn't need to be necessarily minus and plus, it just needs to be a minus charge and a different minus charge on the other side or a different charge altogether. Um, so you could also have trigonal bipyramidal. You could have uh, octahedral with the exact same atoms. So if you had PF5, SF6, those are fitting those categories there. These molecules here are nonpolar. And then if you have most of the other geometries, if you have things like um, the, the bent structure, if you have like water's polar, ammonia here, trigonal, pyramidal's polar. Um, if you imagine a seesaw structure would be polar, even if you have, so like SF4 is polar from a molecule we saw earlier, ClF3 or BRF3, these are polar. The only time we get back to nonpolar would be something like xenon F2, which has three electron pairs around the, um, the, the xenon, and then a linear xenon F set of bonds. And so this molecule here ends up being nonpolar. And then if we go through the possibilities for octahedral, so the three geometries that we see within octahedral are octahedral, like SF6. We have um, something like BRF5, which would be a square pyramid. So BRF5, lone pair on bromine. And then we have this square pyramid structure. And that's certainly going to be polar because we get this big negative charge up here that's not counterbalanced by the electron pair below. You might think electron pairs are negative, but it's not the, the fact that we need negative charge. We need the exact same charge that this fluorine bears to be balanced by the bottom end of the molecule with another fluorine atom with the exact same charge. We don't see that, so this molecule here is polar. And then if we have xenon F4, that's square planar. So we have a perfectly square planar structure, and this molecule here, dipoles oppose, dipoles oppose, and this molecule here is nonpolar as a result. So you just need to interpret shape. Try to think of shape that's not symmetrical. Think of um, an electron pair that's gonna bend bond angles off their like usual structures. Like if you're predicting this bond angle here, which looks like it should be about 90, it's a little less than 90 degrees. Whenever you're predicting that bond angles are being impacted by electron pairs, that's another way that you might be able to predict that those molecules are going to be polar. The xenon F4, you might think of the lone pairs trying to bend those bonds off of perfect 90, but you have a lone pair on one side, a lone pair on the other, and the molecule stays perfectly 90. So these bond angles here are exactly equal to 90 degrees. So think about needing electron pairs that are able to give the molecule some sort of break in its symmetry, give it one charge on one side of the molecule compared to the other. Um, I think there's a lot of really hard dipole, like polar questions we could ask. I don't think we go too hard on the test. There's a lot of practice um, exam questions on like the daily quizzes and things that I think are probably a little bit harder. Um, but if you can sort of recognize the difference between CO2 versus water, if you can recognize the difference between like CF4 and like CH2, F2, I think hopefully we're on the right track. Can we predict the properties of things like SO2 versus ICL5? Hopefully we can. This is 18 electrons. We did the geometry earlier, but lone pair, we had that on sulfur because of that extra set of electrons. So we have 18 electrons. We pull in at least one double bond here. We can imagine the resonant effect over to here. So we have a structure that looks like this, where we have equivalent bonds 
Um, I don't think they'll ask you about the bond order on the test, but I think we've done this enough times that calling that a three halves bond for each of those. But the key is that it's the same bond. I think that's probably more important than recognizing the bond order here of what we might classify the number, but it's that seeing that this bond length is the exact same as the other bond length due to that resonant effect. Um, but in terms of the structure here, we have a bent bond, electron pair. We have negative charged oxygens. The, the, in the two Lewis structures, you can write the minus charge on O is either minus or zero. So these charges work out to be minus one half on either O. But either way you see it, the oxygens are negative, the sulfur is positive, and we definitely have a difference of charge. So we definitely have a polar molecule for SO2. So SO2 is polar. Um, if we go to a similar an, uh, analog to SO2 is SO3. SO3 has the Lewis structure. One of them, it looks like this. And then we have the resonant effect where those electron pairs can resonate just like an SO2. So we can move these electron pairs to here, move these electron pairs to there. And then our average structure looks kind of like this. And our bonds are all identical to each other. So we have perfect 120 degree bond angles because this is a perfect trigonal planar molecule. And so do you predict SO3 to be polar or nonpolar? It's nonpolar because we have the exact same charge on our O atoms all the way around the molecule. It's just like BF3 is nonpolar, this molecule here is nonpolar. So SO2 polar, SO3 nonpolar. ICL5 just like BRF5. Yep. Well, yeah, so like if we wanted to go with the um, a Lewis structure that looked more like this. Oh, okay. Let, let me think of this one here and then let's relate it back to SO2. Um, so for SO3, if, if, we do, if we do want to do the structure here and we're calling these zero formal charges, just make sure we think that oxygen is more or less a negative so then we kick the polarity on which makes the O's negative. But still a nonpolar molecule. So like if you're, sometimes questions ask, like is the molecule nonpolar but because the bonds are nonpolar or is it nonpolar because of the, the cancellation of the dipoles? So this one is due to cancellation of the dipoles. So this is a polar nonpolar molecule but with polar bonds. And if we go back to the SO2 example, you could sketch this Lewis structure here to minimize magnitudes of formal charge. I don't think our test would ever ask which of these two Lewis structures is better than the other. They may just ask, give us a Lewis structure of SO2 that satisfies the octet rule or doesn't expand the octet of sulfur, or give us an octet, or give us a, a Lewis structure, or consider the Lewis structure where you minimize magnitudes of formal charge. I think our questions about this would be more like, is a molecule polar or nonpolar, or um, uh, are the two bonds the same length as each other? So I think pro in which, whichever structure you look at, you should be able to say, yes, the bonds are the same length as each other, and then um, that the uh, molecule is still nonpolar. So in this structure here, just allow the bonds being polar to kick the electronegativity on to make the oxygens negative. So if you're looking for, is the molecule polar, you need there to be like charges. You need there to be a difference of electronegativity so S versus O, O is one of the most electronegative atoms. You pair it up with anything but itself, the bond's going to be polar. And so without even being provided um, a, a table of electronegativity values, you know that this bond has to be polar. And so I don't think we ever ask a question that's like, is a bond polar or nonpolar? You know, like if I said, you know, like HI, for example, is pretty close in electronegativity. Um, but I think that's a bad question because, you know, we can give you a dipole moment, it points towards I, I really is negatively charged. So a nonpolar bond should really have charges of really close to zero and zero, which rarely will happen anytime two different atoms bond with each other. So even if their electronegativities are similar, a good example of this would be like NCL3. So NCL3, these bonds, like the electronegativity of N and CL are both 3.0. If you happen to know that, you know that, that their electronegativities are the same. So you might think that this molecule is nonpolar because the bond's nonpolar, but it actually is a perfectly polar compound. There is a difference of charge here. The dipole moment of this compound is about 0.6 Debye, which is a relatively big dipole moment. So just kind of showing you that anytime you have two different atoms bonded together that aren't the same, the bond's going to be polar. And then the greater the separation on the periodic table, or the more you have a more polar versus a less or excuse me, a more electronegative versus a less electronegative atom, 
So the greater the difference of separation of the periodic table, then the more polar the bond is. So questions might be like, is a CF bond more or less polar than an OF bond? So like if you're ranking polarity, like CF is a more polar bond than OF because it's about the difference of electronegativity. It's not about having two really electronegative atoms. It's about having a lesser electronegative and a more electronegative giving a bigger difference. And so this bond here is more polar. ICL5 is the, the, the same as the BRF5. So this geometry here is going to be that square uh, pyramidal structure. We have an electron pair on iodine. How do we know this? Well, just imagine five fluorines, each with eight electrons, and then count seven times six. These are both halogens, I and Cl. So that gives us a total of 42 electrons, 40 electrons, around the five fluorines, each with eight electrons, gives us two electrons left over to go on to the central iodine as a lone pair. And so this structure here has six total domains, five bonding, one non-bonding, and fits that square uh, pyramidal structure. And so this is a square pyramid. Hopefully you can see that it's one pyramid. That's why it's not a bipyramid. And so this is a square pyramid geometry. And then we do get a dipole moment here. So we have a negative charge on fluorine, not canceled off by the uh, fluorine below. The other fluorines are mostly canceling each other out because they're approximately 180 degrees relative to each other. They're not perfectly 180 though, so they're gonna be bowed a little bit. Um, but we're getting most of our negative charge sitting right up on top of the molecule, not balanced by the bottom. So this molecule is polar. So we can predict polarity in um, ICL5 is polar, SO2 is nonpolar. Um, and then uh, SO3 would be nonpolar. And so for most bonds, it's, you know, unless the atoms are the same, like if you have like an F2 bond where the molecule is nonpolar because of the exact same atom, then you have a polar bond. So as long as the atoms are different from each other, the bond's going to be polar. This question here, I, I can't remember if this was on one of the practice exams. So you, some of you guys may have seen this. Um, this is a question that was on a practice exam, or on a real exam, um, like five or so years ago. And it was a pretty tricky question at the time, but I think what this question here is getting at, we kind of sketched something like this um, back in, um, when we are introducing um, plots that look like this. We looked at a hydrogen-hydrogen plot where we were seeing the bond being formed. And so if this is a carbon-carbon single bond, um, what would a carbon-carbon double bond look like? And so the carbon-carbon double bond is going to be shorter because we have the extra electron pair. So this is a shorter bond than the single bond. And then it's also stronger. And so what would it mean on this diagram for a bond to look shorter? Well, this point here is going to be at a shorter distance. So the minimum energy point is at equilibrium bond distance, the, the, the most stable bond distance. So that's going to occur at a shorter bond distance. And so if we look here, this is wrong here, answer A, because it's predicting the same bond length. So the reason why I can say this structure here is wrong is because it would be showing the double bond as having the same bond length as a single bond, so that would not be correct. And so this graph here also showing the single bond to have the same bond length, so that would be wrong. And then this D is properly showing that as we go to a carbon-carbon double bond, the bond shortens. So if you notice the, the solid line moves over to the left, that indicates a shorter bond, so that's good. But it indicates the exact same bond strength because this difference here is our carbon separated from each other. And then when we form the bond, the difference from here to here is our bond enthalpy. So this is our bond strength or related to our bond strength. So if we make a stronger bond, the bond should go to a deeper potential well. So we are going to drop to a lower energy, meaning it takes more energy to break the bond. Um, so more energy to break the bond means stronger and then shorter. So a tricky question, but this is just kind of graphically trying to show that like we're getting bond strength uh, from um, we're getting bond strength from the picture of the molecule at the bottom of the well up to here. So this difference of energy here is our bond strength. So make the bond stronger, the potential well drops lower, make the bond weaker, it's higher. So a weaker bond of the same bond length would look like this. So that's a weaker bond, stronger bond goes lower. So when we get into bonding models of uh, uh, theories that describe bonding, valence bond and hybrid theory are all about overlap of orbitals. 
Think of overlap of orbitals that have room for electrons to, um, to share a bond with each other. And so we could think of hydrogen and hydrogen, lone pairs being in 1s orbital. So we get 1s, 1s overlap. So we have orbitals with room for electrons, and then we have the overlap of those orbitals. And so we get this sigma bond here um, from our 1s, 1s. If you have like a hydrogen with like a chlorine, think of chlorine's largest orbital that has the lone pair. So think of how it would have the 3s2, 3p5 configuration. And then just think of how this lone pair is in a 3p orbital. And so you have that 3p orbital overlapping with hydrogen's um, electrons. So we get that 1s, 3p overlap. And then for things that don't naturally have orbitals where you need them to be, since orbitals, the p orbitals are at 90 degrees relative to each other, a tetrahedral molecule has bond angles of 109.5. So within hybrid theory, we, we change the shape of the orbitals to fit the shape of the molecule. So if we have CF4 is tetrahedral, we know that the molecule has to have the shape where the bond angles the whole way around the molecule for a perfect tetrahedral structure. 109.5 degrees for every bond angle around the molecule. They're all identical bonds. And then what we would have is that carbon would need to take its, you know, its base configuration would be a 2s2, 2p2. So we'd have something that looks like 2s2 that looks like this and say, instead of these orbitals trying to overlap with the fluorines, what if they change shape and they change shape into something that looks like for equivalent orbitals that we call the sp3 orbitals. So we take all of these orbitals here that carbon has available, so all four, we need to take the 2s and then all three of the 2p orbitals, so we call it sp3 hybridization. And then the sp3 hybridization points those orbitals on carbon at the shape of a tetrahedron. So this is like uh, mathematics, this is just voodoo science, if you will. This is just literally taking what looks like this and then turning it into something that looks like a tetrahedron. And so then we get overlap. And so fluorine's largest orbital is a 2p. It's supposed to be a 2, not an s. So the largest orbital on fluorine is a 2p. That's the orbital that has a leftover electrons. We have the carbon with electron pairs. Kind of think of carbon has four electrons, so now think of four electrons in these hybrid orbitals that then overlap with the orbitals of, of fluorine, so we get the overlap here. So we would call the overlap in the bonding in CF4 to be sp3 2p overlap. So for a central atom that has to make a bond to two atoms or more, for making bonds to two atoms or to three atoms or to four atoms, then we want to hybridize the central atom. If we have just an atom making one bond, then we can usually just think of, if you will, the native orbitals on the atom. Like if I'm making this one bond, I can just think of the atoms on chlorine that, that make the bond. Um, but if I have two bonds in the central atom, I'm going to want to hybridize the central atom. And so linear molecules like CO2 have sp hybridization. So I need orbital one, orbital two. So I need to hybridize two orbitals on carbon. If I have something like BF3, which I know is trigonal planar, then I need to have sp2 hybridization because I need to take three orbitals to get three orbitals to pair up with fluorine. So BF3s would be sp2, uh, 2p overlap to describe the bond there. Carbon's bonds would be described by oxygen. You might think of oxygen as being sp2 perhaps, and then oxygen being sp2, sp with carbon. Um, but the key would be that you get the sigma overlap and you get the leftover p orbitals that's not hybridized. So carbon has two leftover p orbitals that can make pi bonds. So we get pi bond number one with one of the p orbitals, pi bond number two with the other. And so for C double bond O for CO2, we get two sigma bonds and then two pi bonds. So you can start describing things as sigma versus pi bonding. So single bonds or sigmas, um, those involve overlapping of either like S and P orbitals or like s orbitals and um, hybrid orbitals or p orbitals and hybrid orbitals so hybrid orbitals themselves will overlap with each other to make sigma bonds and then the p orbitals that aren't hybridized can make the pi bonds and so the bonding model that you get from or one of the pictures you get from hybrid theory is a good picture of what goes on in pi bonding and that looks a lot like the pi bonding we see in mo theory mo theory We'll look at that in a minute, but that's a totally different branch of theory than hybrid theory. And, but the pi bonding looks very similar with the two models. So I think we get a very good picture of what goes on in pi bonding with hybrid theory.
The actual hybridization of orbitals, atoms don't really do that. But this comes back to where this is just a model, treated as a model. You can use it later, you'll see it in OCHEM, and hopefully you'll find, or your teachers will make you find some utility in it. And so uh, if we're looking at um, ethylene, so C2H4, which has a double bond. What, like, how do we know it has a double bond? When I see C2H4, and I know I'm connecting hydrogen here, if I'm not sure this is a double, how do I know that's a double versus single versus a triple? Well, we just want to give carbon uh, four bonds if we can, and we also want to use the proper number of electrons. So two times four plus four times one gives us a total of... Uh, 12 electrons to distribute. So I have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. So I use the proper number of electrons. All the atoms have zero formal charges and uh, um, uh, the, uh, their octets are satisfied. And so we end up with this structure here. And so these two atoms here would be sp2 hybridized. So my sp2, sp2 overlap here of these two orbitals between carbon is my sigma bond. So that sp2, sp2 overlap would be the sigma bond. But what about the pi bond? Well, the pi bonds from that p orbital of those atoms that are left over sticking straight out of the page that overlap with each other. So just picture two orbitals sticking straight out of carbon, and then they overlap with each other, making a planar type bond. We could also picture this molecule here if we sketched the hydrogens. Um, like take the hydrogen in, in your paper and imagine just rotating 90 degrees so that we can send the hydrogens coming back and coming straight out at us. Now we can picture maybe this orbital here in the plane of the paper that this is the pi bond. And so that's the pi bond between carbon-carbon. That's what makes up the double bond. And so our carbon-carbon double bond this is a sigma plus a pi bond. The sigma is the sp2, sp2 overlap, and then the pi bonds, the 2p, 2p overlap from the unhybridized p orbitals. And so what makes up the pi bond are the two 2p orbitals overlapping with each other that aren't hybridized. And so if we wanted to describe the hydrogen to carbon bond, if we wanted to say, well, what's this bond here? That's sp2, 1s overlap. So the 1s of hydrogen, the sp2 of carbon overlapping to make those bonds. So which molecule below would be considered to be sp hybridized? So to be sp hybridized means the molecule would have to be linear. Again, sp2 would be trigonal planar. sp3 would be tetrahedral. Does anybody remember learning sp3d or sp3d2 in high school? Did everybody ever see those? Like sp3, in case anybody in the room has seen these, we don't teach these because we don't really believe those are actual hybridization. Well, it's really funny, sp2 and sp3 don't really happen either. But, um, but those don't really happen, so we don't really teach those anymore. Um, kind of funny where we draw that line. Um, so you may have seen those before. You may be wondering, do you describe hybridizations of trigonal, bipyramidal, or octahedral? We don't talk about hybridizations of the central atom in those geometries. So don't worry about those if you had seen those before. And so for SP, we're looking for the linear molecule. Um, so PF3 can't be linear because it doesn't have um, three total atoms. Um, formaldehyde can't be linear. So these molecules here, PF3 is tetrahedral domain. So that would be SP3. We did the structure earlier. Just remember, phosphorus has an electron pair than the three domains with fluorine, so that's sp3. CH2O, we've done this previously, not today, but we've done this before. We get this double bond here, lone pairs here. So this is trigonal planar. We talked about how the single bonds repel each other a little less. We get a slight greater 120 degree bond angle. The molecule would be polar if we're asking about polarity, but in terms of this question here, the central atom would be sp2 because it has three total domains. And so our choices are between SF2. We did this structure earlier. Remember, sulfur has the lone pair, two of them. So our bond here becomes bent as a result of being tetrahedral domain. So SF2 here, if we want to describe the bonding, would be sp3 hybridized. Because we look at the central atoms uh, geometry, the electron domain geometry. So sp3, tetrahedral. Um, for BEF2, this is going to be the sp hybridization because we have a linear molecule. We have two total electrons plus 14. That gives us 16 total. So we're good with this structure here. 
Beryllium has a zero formal charge because it only has two electrons, has its two electrons, so it's happy with its formal charge. Fluorines are happy enough to then steal more electrons off of beryllium to pick up a partial negative. This molecule here would be nonpolar as a result of the charges being identical in the two fluorines. But in terms of the question, beryllium has two domains, would be sp hybridized. So it picks up that linear geometry, SP hybridization. Counting, and I think this was a similar question we've seen before in, in lecture, but um, according to hybrid theory, how many SP2 hybridized carbon atoms are present in the molecule below? And so I think before we were counting sigma and pi. If you remember, I think we did this in class where we were counting that we had you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine sigma bonds. And then we were counting that the, um, the doubles are a sigma and a pi. So we get one pi, two pi, and then three, four pi bonds. Because our triple is a sigma plus two pi bonds. And then our double bonds are each a sigma plus a pi. So for counting sigmas, the single bonds are, of course, sigma, so that's where we come up with nine. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine sigma, and then the four pi bonds. Now in terms of sp2 hybridization, this is just basically saying how many carbon atoms are, are um, trigonal planar in their geometry. So that's trigonal planar because it has three domains. Let me make sure to erase some of the stuff so we can clearly see. One, two, three domains. So that's sp2, the next carbon is sp2, and then the third carbon is sp2, the fourth one is sp. So I get three sp2 carbons because I have three carbons that are trigonal planar geometry, and then one is linear, it would be sp. Oxygen might be sp3. Nitrogen, sometimes you don't necessarily need to hybridize an atom that's just making one bond, but if you did, I think you would say sp, because you get the lone electron pair in an sp orbital, the sigma bond with an sp orbital, and the leftover p orbitals making up the pi bonds. So let's talk about MO theory. So for, um, for like uh, this here, in terms of what molecular orbital is being shown, if I'm looking between sigma versus pi, might be thinking, okay, is this like an S versus a P orbital? When I look at this orbital here, I'm kind of thinking, does this look like an S? Does this look like a, a P orbital? And then does it look like a bond that's symmetrical about the line of the axis, the two centers here, the nuclei of the atoms? So is my bond symmetrical about the axis of the bond or the plane of the bond? And so is that bond symmetrical about the axis or the plane? And I think it looks like it's symmetrical about the axis, so that's a sigma bond. If you started seeing a bond that looked like, like this, now that's a bond that's symmetrical about the plane. So that's not a, a symmetrical bond. Think about how that's not symmetrical about the axis, because if it's symmetrical about the axis, then the little lobe here would be symmetrical the whole way around the molecule, and it's not. It's just up here. So the greatest probability of finding an electron in a pi bond is above the bond, below the bond. Um, and then that's not symmetrical about the bond axis itself. So this is a pi bond, this is a sigma bond. And so then if the, the uh, majority of the electrons, the probability of finding the electrons between the nuclei, that's a bonding orbital. And if the probability of finding the electron is mostly to the outside of where the nuclei lie, then that's a anti-bonding orbital. So this would be a sigma star anti-bonding orbital. And so what this to me looks like is the anti-bonding orbital for something like H2. So if we're making a MO diagram for hydrogen, you might be thinking, okay, hydrogen has a 1s orbital, the other hydrogen and it has a 1s orbital, and we get the bonding contribution. This axis here is energy, so we get a bonding orbital where the energy is being stabilized by either the overlapping of the orbitals or the, um, um, the uh, constructively interfering waves. If you think of an electron that's spinning around its nucleus, if it meets the other electron as it's spinning kind of in the opposite direction, but in the same location. That's constructive interference. And so that's the electrons meeting here for H2 because I have to put two electrons in. And then I get my sigma 1s bonding orbital. I have my sigma 1s star anti-bonding orbital. No electron pairs in that orbital in this molecule. So it gets the most possible bang for its buck in terms of stability. And then because we don't have to put any electrons in the sigma star orbital, our bond order is equal to one. 
we have a half times two uh, for the bond order to be a single bond. So it's the exact bond order we would expect. And then the actual appearance of these orbitals would be the 1s would look kind of like the nuclei here, would look like the greatest density in the middle. And then the sigma 1s star would look just like this orbital over here, where it's the anti-bonding orbital putting the electrons on the other side of the nuclei. So greatest probability coming over here. And so then when I think of like, what would a sigma bonding orbital look like for p orbitals versus the anti-bonding for p orbitals, if I'm picturing the p orbitals pointing straight at each other between the nuclei, then that bonding orbital takes on a look kind of like this. So this would be a sigma like 2p bonding orbital. If I think of what a sigma star orbital, the antibond of that orbital, it would look like the greatest probability far away from the nucleus, and then the probability furthest away from the other nucleus. So this would be the sigma star 2p. And so we have a node in the middle then um, of that orbital, just like we have a node here. That's just a region where there's no probability of finding an electron. So anytime you see no shading, that's a nodal region where there's no probability of finding an electron that helps you find the antibonding orbitals. And so then what about the pi um, star bonding orbitals for or, or the pi versus the pi star orbitals? Um, so when we have 2p orbitals that look like this that are overlapping, we get a pi bond that looks like this. And so that's our pi bonding orbital between the two p's. And then what does the antibonding orbital look like? The pi star kind of just looks like almost like a butterfly because you now have the greatest probability of finding an electron away from the nuclei. So this is what a pi star looks like. And so notice pi is planar. Sigma is symmetrical about the bond axis. And so symmetrical about the bond axis, symmetrical about the bond plane. Um, let's think of real quick something like, what, what about ions? We talked a little bit about ions like um, O2, 2 minus, O2 minus, things like that. C2, 2 minus have been examples. But what about something like H2 with a positive charge or H2 with a minus charge? What if we kick electrons on or off the structure? So what about H2 with a minus charge? What do I do here? Well, instead of putting two electrons in, I'm putting three, and I have to put an electron in the next highest orbital in that sigma star 1s. And so if I said, well, what's the bond order here for H2 with a minus charge? My bond order would be a half, two bonding electrons minus the one antibonding. So I have a bond order of a half. This molecule is allowed to exist, probably not going to be a stable ion that you're going to make compounds out of, but this thing could exist and you could characterize it, get some properties of it. You could also have like H2 with a positive charge. So you can kick an electron off of H2 where you just put one electron into the diagram. And so that would just have like one electron in the sigma 1s orbital. So now our bond order would be a half times one for a half. So we get a bond order of half for H2 plus and H2 minus. So you can do ions of like hydrogen like ions. We were also looking at helium-2. You could consider he helium-2 cations with this type of picture here, where you're kicking electrons off of helium. Um, helium itself, two electrons in the 1s, two in the 1s star, doesn't exist because we have no net bond. So we were talking about that previously. Let's kind of look at um, some MO diagram questions for um, atoms in the second row of the periodic table. So what about O2 with a minus charge? So this here is just showing our 2s and our 2p. And this is just kind of letting us think of atom A, letting us think of atom B in the molecule. And so whenever we have O2, F2, neon 2, or an ion of those, we have the sigma 2p is here. If we have B2, C2, N2, and their ions, the sigma 2p orbital just changes spots and it's higher in energy than the pi 2p set. That's the only difference between the two set of diagrams. This is given here. You'll be given this like within the question like this one on the test. So you don't have to memorize these two diagrams. You just have to think of how we use them if I'm plugging in for O2 minus is in the middle. So this might be O, this might be O minus, and what you write out here almost doesn't matter too much. But don't let this confuse you too much. You might just be thinking of oxygen pairing up with oxygen minus. And so I'm just adding an extra electron to oxygen minus. The only reason why you might want to think of this is you're just picturing the orbitals of those two atoms in the ion overlapping with each other. So you may just be thinking, okay, I have, you know, atom one that has kind of, you know, orbitals that look something like this flying at the other atom that has orbitals that look like the same type of orbitals. And then I'm not showing the extra orbitals sticking straight out of the page that these orbitals just overlap with each other. 
in ways that the diagram's trying to show. Energy is the hidden axis going upward, so the 2s orbital is more stable, so they sort of come first in terms of energy. So we have the sigma 2s, the sigma star 2s as the first two orbitals, and then we have the sigma 2p, and then the pi 2p. You can always spot the pi because they're the ones that there's two of, so there's two pi's but just one sigma, and that's because if you think of orbitals that look like, like this, and like this, that the sigma is this one here, and then the pi are the ones like this and like this. So the pi are the ones I get two of, the sigma I just get one of. And so the pi 2p here come before the energy of the sigma 2p. Um, and so, so anyways, I'm filling electrons in, we go 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, um, 12, and then 13. Maybe I should have counted first, but the counting here would just be 2 times 6, plus one for the negative charge, that's 13 electrons going in. And so we go 13 total electrons. We think of Hund's rule, we try to sp maximize the spin of the electrons, but I have to spin pair the 13th electron. And so this molecule here has one unpaired electron. It just takes one or more for it to be termed paramagnetic. So think paramagnetic pulled into a magnetic field. If you're pulled into a magnetic field, you're probably magnetic, so that's the magnetic property of the substance. The other term would be diamagnetic if all the electrons were spin paired and it's actually repelled by the magnetic field or just think not pulled into or not magnetic relative to the magnetic field. And then the question here is looking for a bond order. So our bond order, I have to look for the, the bonding orbitals or the, the, the orbitals the electrons are falling between the nuclei, the anti-bonding electrons are breaking the bonds we just tried to make. So I end up with only ever a maximum of eight bonding electrons. So the most you can ever come up with in terms of bonding electrons is eight. So that's the max number of bonding electrons you can ever have in MO theory. Because the other electrons are anti-bonding, and so they're trying to break the bonds that we're trying to make with the bonding electrons. And so we have five anti-bonding electrons here within this molecule. And so I have the, 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 the sigma 2s star and then the pi star 2p. So I have five total electrons there. This gives me a bond order of three halves. So you can get a fractional bond order, that's fine within molecular orbital theory. And so O2 with a minus charge, three halves. So you can do ions, just add up the proper number of electrons. You don't need to worry a whole lot. You don't necessarily even need to sketch in the O and the O minus here. If that helps you picture the idea of what the diagram is trying to show is the orbitals overlapping with each other as the atoms are being made through um, sort of the overlap as the atoms approach each other, that might help you picture um, where the diagram's sort of coming from and what it's supposed to be trying to tell us. If we had an example, maybe the next one, what's the next question here? Um, which molecule below is diamagnetic? Um, so diamagnetism, all spin paired electrons. So my choices are B2, C2, O2. So over here for B2. So B2, three valence electrons for boron. So I go three times two for six electrons in, so two four, and then six. So B2 has unpaired electrons and is paramagnetic, not diamagnetic. C2, we spin pair the next two electrons. Now that molecule is diamagnetic. All its electrons are spin paired, not pulled into a magnetic field. And O2 was kind of the whole reason we got into this business, because we were trying to understand for O2 with 12 electrons, how does it have the property that's pulled into a magnetic field, it's the presence or the, the fact that it has these unpaired electrons in its structure, and that this MO theory is just a more complete bonding model. So if we're, if we're ranking models, the other models we've seen are a little incomplete in describing what goes on with the non-bonding electrons, but it gets the averaging right. Like when we look at a Lewis structure, it's kind of right that oxygen on average has two lone pairs of electrons. We just didn't know what they were doing spin-wise. MO theory shows us that there's a net spin here it kind of gives us a more complete picture of what's going on in the bonding of the molecule. But for the most part, we don't get different bond orders. We don't get a much different picture. We just get a little bit more of a complete picture of really how to think of what non-bonding electrons are. Non-bonding electrons in MO theory are the results of a bond canceled with its anti-bond. So whenever you make a bond and you have the anti-bonding electrons, those kind of average out to be non-bonding electrons. So O2 is paramagnetic. And then one final question here. Uh, we could rank bond lengths uh, with MO theory because the idea here is just get your bond order from MO theory. So rank their bond orders and then think of how bond lengths kind of compare. And so for, um, for B2, our bond order here would be, um, we'd have 
these as our bonding electrons, and then these as our anti-bonding electrons. And since we're counting electrons, our, we multiply by half. So that just goes to pairs. So we have one net bonding pair of electrons. So we have a bond order of one for B2. Uh, for C2, two more electrons. C2s would be a half. And then six minus two, because I now have six bonding electrons. I've added two more bonding electrons, so I have a double bond for C2. And then O2 has a bond order of a half, and we have all eight, the maximum number of bonding electrons, and then four anti-bonding electrons. And so that's a bond order of two. And then F2 has a bond order of one because we add two more electrons to the anti-bonding orbital. So for F2, we go four minus six, four, one. And so now the longest bond is either going to be the single bond B2 or the single bond F2. And boron's just bigger. Probably not a big detail for our test uh, in terms of ranking B2 versus F2 because that's more of a chapter seven concept. But boron's the bigger atom, so B2 ends up being longer. But we can, I, the idea here is just rank single bonds longer, double bonds shorter, triple bonds the shortest. So that's kind of the key detail to look for on our midterm. All right, that's our time. So good luck on the test. Um, I have office hours right after class and two to three today.